How y'all doing? I'm Chris Ignato with Nature Here and Now. So the star of today's video is a bit of a friend to us all and is none other than the American Robin. And I say, let's get the show rolling. So I guess it should start off by saying how the American Robin got its name because it's kind of interesting. So, well, American Robin sort of suggests that there are other Robins out there and there are. It was the European robin that inspired the name, and it's really neat as to how that happened. Um, well, let's go back several hundred years to when the Europeans got here. And, well, it was the vast unknown. There was so much unfamiliarity and intimidation in this new land. You know, so many obstacles to overcome with challenges and even threats lurking around every corner. Well, they felt the Europeans felt very alienated. They were in a complete different world and they themselves were aliens. So, you know, trying to overcome everything, they spotted the American Robin and it inspired in them a touch of the familiar because it reminded them of the European Robin because of, well, the European Robin has a bit of a red face and a red breast. However, that's the only thing that it shares in common with the American Robin. It's a totally different looking bird, but they felt comforted by seeing the American Robin and having it remind them of a piece of home, something that they were very fond of, a friend, if you will. Holy cow. What was that? Talk about the unknown, right? Where was I? <laughs> um, okay, so the Europeans spotted the American Robin and they felt a warm familiarity because it reminded them of such a friend that they saw back home, the European Robin. So they named the American Robin after that bird based on the red breast. And uh, it's been a friend of ours ever since. If you know the American Robin, you're already quite aware of the fact that they are everywhere, right? both North and Central America, but these are migratory birds. And like most migratory birds, they can migrate up to 3,000 miles away. Many of the robins in my area, Pennsylvania, will actually spend the winter here. And, um, but you know, in farther North, they might migrate South to where there are better food reserves. And again, most migratory birds like to start nesting and breeding in areas where food will become abundant once those eggs hatch, of course, so that there could be abundant foods when the babies start growing up. As far as the robins that stay here in Pennsylvania, throughout the winter months, they generally feed on, well, fruits and berries and stuff like that. Right now, it is pretty much spring, right? And that's when the robins are weaning themselves off the fruit and berries from the winter and start feeding more exclusively on the insects and of course worms. Now something I can thank my mom for is uh, years ago while watching robins in the backyard, you know, we'd notice them kind of dart along and stop, dart along and stop, and you would see them tilting their head towards the ground. You know, they'd stop and they'd tilt their head and listen. And then you'd watch them snatch up a worm you know, and I just find that extremely entertaining to watch that these, these birds are hearing the worms and even insects moving about several inches beneath the soil surface. That was a robin alarm call. Learn that call because you can learn volumes about what's going on around you based on that call. That call just let me know that there's probably a domestic cat nearby because there's nobody walking over there. And uh, it didn't actually hook though, it took off. So maybe that means that there's, see what I'm talking about? It's actually uh, a human being, so I was wrong. You remember that alarm call with the robin that happened just a, a minute ago? And I said that it's probably a domestic cat. That's because no humans have I ever seen walking through that spot. But my initial impression was the fact that it was a human because the bird, as I said, did not hook. If it was like a cat or something, it would have hooked a branch about eight to 12 feet off the ground. Um, when it's a human being, it's usually like 14 to 16 feet. This robin shot up towards the top of the tree and then went along. 
And sure enough, a human being just came walking through an area I did not expect to see a human being. The birds do not lie, and that's your food. Anyhow, the American robin should be called the common robin, in my opinion, because they could be found anywhere in North America from, you know, fields to woodland edges, the forests themselves, lakes, ponds, even urban environments. And, you know, actually, back in the 40s or so, the population of robins started dropping dramatically. And, you know, it took us a while to figure out why. And as you may already know, it turned out that DDT was wrecking havoc on their population. And of course, if you think about it, DDT was poisoning and killing insects. In the warmer months, robins eat insects. So unfortunately, that started killing off millions of robins. And once we caught on, we stopped using the DDT in order to help save the birds, right? Because people are not evil. And their population started making a comeback. Now, to this day, the robin population, another alarm call, uh, is rather healthy, but they do still face challenges and obstacles that are directly related to human beings. Um, let's take cities, for example. You have a lot of pavement and concrete, right? Well, that makes you know, access to soil and the worms that live within it a little challenging. So if you get rid of backyards and forests and fields and stuff, they're going to have less access to their food. They'll start starving out or perhaps move elsewhere where they can actually acquire their food. But there are other challenges. Light pollution, believe it or not, affects the robin population. It makes it difficult for them to sleep at night and just kind of causes all sorts of trouble. But the main trouble these days is actually sound pollution. You know, think about the hustle and bustle of urban life. You've got horns blaring, you know, sirens, ambulances, police, people shouting, um, you know, traffic signals going on and off and just tons and tons of noise. And it makes it difficult for the rabbits to hear each other, especially during breeding season. If you're calling out for a girlfriend and she can't hear you, you know, good luck with that. Robins have made an amazing adaptation though. They actually have increased the pitch of their song. It is now a higher frequency so that it can be heard over the sounds of city life. And uh, so the robins you hear today, their song is actually different than the song you might have heard 40, 50 years ago. And I just find that really neat. You know, our grandparents, uh, they heard a different song from the robins than we're hearing today. And I have to give my mom credit. While the robins sing their famous song, you know, any time of the day that they wish, it definitely becomes more, more abundant before and after rainfall. You know, that, that characteristic cheery, cheery, cheerily song, something like that. I'll just play a clip. That being said, keep in mind that robins are actually songbirds. And we're all rather familiar with the song of the robin, um, but they're a little different from some of the other species of songbird. Frequently, songbirds have those bright feathers and they sit high up in the treetops singing their songs. Well, that's one of the reasons why. Those bright colors, you better stay off the ground where predators can get you. You're gonna sit up there and sing the song. The robin doesn't have those bright colors, does it? I mean, it's got that, that rouge, rosy breast, but it's an overall drab color you know, grayish brown, and it blends in perfectly with the, the debris and stuff, especially in the forest floor. Now, when robins build their nests, they will often build the nests within the trees, close to the trunk, you know, hidden by tons and tons of leaves and stuff, but robins could build their nest anywhere they really want to. They pretty much build that nest anywhere that provides a suitable location for that wonderfully bowl-shaped nest that robins are so good at constructing. If you want to observe robins, just sit on a bench somewhere, checking out, you know, a yard overlooking some grass, or look to the trees. You know, right now there's a robin sitting in a tree above me, and that's where they spend at least half their time. But on to the next thing. Now, speaking of the robin's nests, robins will lay up to three different clutches of eggs in one breeding season. And those clutches are usually comprised of anywhere from three to five eggs. And uh, granted, the mortality rate of those eggs and of the babies themselves is a little high. 
You know, it's very rare for any birds to lay a clutch of eggs and have all those babies actually hatch and reach maturity. You know, there's a lot of predation that goes on with other birds, even birds such as the blue jays that will rob those nests. And then you've got some of the hawks or occipiters that will, you know, prey on the birds themselves. Um, but something that's very, well, extremely characteristic of spring is that beautiful powder blue egg that the robin is famous for. Um, you know, if you're lucky, you might actually see some robin's eggs come Easter. And now, now I actually wonder, is that one of the reasons why we dye Easter eggs? To, you know, remind us that spring is here. Because Easter is a great symbol of spring. Um, and what other symbol of spring is better than the robin's egg? You know, you're walking around on a beautiful spring day. You see the shell of a robin's egg that's discarded well away from the nest so as not to attract predators. Uh, that's kind of cool. Um, you know, a lot of people are not happy about the parasitic birds that are out there. I think one of them is the cowbird and people fear that the cowbird is laying the eggs in the robin's nests and it's not fair in the robin's. The robin's can actually differentiate other birds' eggs from their own and I wonder if that blue plays no small role in that. But if a robin finds someone else's egg within their nest, that robin will push the, the egg away. You know, it'll get rid of that egg so that only the robin's eggs will remain in the nest. So don't worry so much when you see those other birds around the robins. In fact, nature has selected and allowed those other birds to exist. Those parasitic birds deserve to be here just as much as anything else does. It doesn't make them evil. That's just what they do. If you're an insect or a worm, you would probably consider robins to be pretty evil. You know, and if we want to be that way about things, almost bigoted, if you will, we might as well be that way across the board. Look at the things that we do. You know, either go all the way with it or don't do it at all. And I actually vote for the second option. Speaking of the mortality rate among robins, something I learned pretty recently that actually surprises me is the fact that the average lifespan of the robin is only two years. That's not very long. And, uh, well, you know, there was an individual observed in the wild to live, I think, 13 years. And there have been a few others that, you know, are somewhere around there. And, of course, some of them are five to six years. But an average of two years definitely suggests that most of them actually succumb sooner than that. And that's incredible. You know, keep in mind that, you know, that only allows one or two breeding seasons. So maybe the successful rearing of those young is actually greater than I thought. I think I said that there's a particular fact about the robins that I find a little bit hilarious and I tried my best to save it till the end of this video. And uh, while there's a small story about it, uh, while I was filming my red wing video, I was looking up, you know, some other locations of the red wing blackbirds and I stumbled upon a couple of articles about the robins because, you know, they're going to be showing up this time of year and a lot of people are still wondering what kind of bird is that. Long story short, I noticed the scientific name of the American robin and I have no idea why I never noticed this before. And if I did, I have no memory of it. <laughs> its scientific name, get this, is Turdus migratorius, the migrating turd. I mean, come on, you can't make this stuff up. Now, I know that's not really what the name means, you know. It, it pretty much means migrating thrush. Robins are migratory birds, and, well, I guess they're in the thrush family, right? So uh, that's what Turtus migratorius actually means, but I, <laughs> I, like, I like my first impression. Migrating turd. <laughs> Who wants to be called that? Anyways, uh, I, I hope you guys had a good time with this video. I mean, I hope you learned a couple of things about the robin. I know I did, you know, with thinking about this. Granted, a lot of it was stuff I already knew, but, you know, the robins are cool birds. They should be a friend to all of us. It's a great bird to observe if you want to start learning the behavior and even the language of birds, because it's a bird you can find all over the place. They're rather vocal. Um, they don't really care that you're nearby. They're going to go about their business doing things. And that, to me, is a rather forgiving species. You know, they're a lot of fun. Um, American Robin deserves a lot of credit, but they already have a lot of credit. 
a lot of people are rather fond of the American Robin. Um, so I hope you are rather fond of my channel. And if so, check out some more videos. Because, yep, I'm desperate. So thanks a lot for watching. I'm Chris Ignato, signing out.